Hi everyone and welcome to tonight's presentation. I'm happy to see so many familiar faces and a few new ones as well. Tonight we are joined by a research associate stationed at the National Museum of Natural History, Dr. David Adamski. Tonight he will share with us the swimming, crawling and flying arthropoda which have existed for millions of years even before humans. Reminder, please remain muted during the presentation. You can send any questions you have throughout in the chat. And of course, there'll be an opportunity to unmute for Q&A. If you enjoyed tonight's presentation, make sure to check out our website and register to join us again next week. Without further ado, Dr. Adamski, take it away. Thank you, Dottie. Um, and I want to thank everyone for joining me in this Zoom program. Uh, wish I could be with you uh, live, but uh, um, coronavirus uh, has another thing in mind. So we will do what we can um, to try to make your evening tonight um, an informative one. And um, I wouldn't say happy, but uh, it's possible. Um, my job at the Natural History Museum um, is to document living things uh, that I study, and I'm a author, so uh, I'm out at night collecting and in museums, uh, getting specimens uh, from various institutions around the world, <clears throat> and when you work in uh, arthropods, and I'll define it later, um, one easily finds out whether they're professional or not, that uh, they're everywhere. And I hope in the presentation to uh, give you some appreciation for uh, the numerous numbers that we have uh, of these animals, uh, both in species and in total numbers. Uh, also, uh, since part of my job is to classify insects, and that's to put them in some order uh, based on <clears throat> some biological characters, um, I hope to confuse you. And in doing that, uh, I don't mean to be rude about it, but uh, the group is so numerous that even though we've been at trying to classify insects for, let's say, a little over 200 years, um, we're still not there. We're still describing species at a fast rate. and we're still trying to figure out what the relationships are between those species. And finally, I hope to show you uh, the different types of body forms, colors uh, that we find um, in this group of animals. So uh, we're gonna move on. I can find the arrow. Here we go. So here I have a drawing of how the living world is divided. And in this simple illustration, uh, we have plants and animals, fungi, you know, the mushrooms. Uh, protista are the uh, one uh, cellular uh, animals like amoeba, paramecia, and then various types of bacteria. So um, we have at least this many. Um, and then uh, using molecular approaches, uh, you know, we find that we have one, two, and then in the eukaryotes, uh, which are fancy name for uh, multicellular 
uh, organisms, we have plants, fungi, and animals. <clears throat> so we have five here, and I was wondering why didn't they have six? Well, uh, that's because they they didn't have one-celled animals, the Propista in here. So that's the reason for that. Their sample size was small. The other thing I wanted to mention is that where do you see viruses? You know, uh, we've been talking about viruses uh, probably ever since uh, you were born, because everybody gets colds, everybody gets some version of flu uh, before the pandemic started. And um, so for homework, um, look up the definition of life. I mean, what you're seeing in the last two slides are um, a representation of the living things on the earth. And <clears throat> there is a reason why we think of these objects as living versus non-living. Uh, that wouldn't be a bad thing to look at either. And, and then uh, try to find out why viruses are not in either one of these schemes. What happened? Uh, we won't get into that here, but I thought it would be an interesting uh, project for someone uh, who's viewing now to uh, take a look to see. So in our kingdoms, uh, what we have here is a representation of a tree, uh, which shows all the plants, animals, virus, uh, not viruses, but uh, protozoans, other bacteria, uh, all of life. And we call this uh, a tree, uh, a tree of life. And we're going to see a lot of trees in the next few minutes. And uh, trees are made from different kinds of information. Uh, in the uh, days when scientists were really philosophers, they, they looked at general uh, morphology, you know, what the animal looked like and tried to put them together that way. <clears throat> Today, we use uh, molecular approaches combined with uh, what they look like. And um, and we try to talk about what is really going on on our planet. Uh, I'm going to move back. So right in the middle here, you're going to see some organisms that maybe look kind of familiar. They all may look familiar, uh, but these in particular you might get to see, uh, in some cases, eat. Other cases run away from, and uh, and so on. So we're going to talk about these animals here, uh, the arthropods. And here's another tree. And what we have is uh, a group, a branch here with millipedes and uh, centipedes. And here are our insects. We have a central group with uh, uh, what we call the, uh, the shrimps and the oysters, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the uh, lobsters, uh, called the crustaceans. And we have a funny animal here coming off, the trilobites, and then in blue, we have uh, the arachnids or the spiders, including the horseshoe crab. So we're going to be talking about these animals. And first I need to mention to you that probably 90 to 95 percent of all life, that's including the uh, plants and bacteria, uh, 95% are uh, arthropods. And to me, that's cool. Somebody else, that might not be so cool. But what is an arthropod? Uh, it's a segmented animal. 
uh, with usually some type of structures that are also segmented that are attached to the body. It has a exoskeleton that it oftentimes needs to crawl out of when it grows. The uh, appendages, whether it be the antennae uh, or the legs, the wings, uh, at least at the base, are segmented. And uh, the digestive system has a, a front opening and a back opening. And there are other differences, uh, or rather similarities as well. But we're going to get back to this now, this tree. And I want to uh, discuss a few concepts. Uh, this tree here is what we call uh, a monophyletic tree. It's a single tree where all the animals up here that you see have been derived from a single common ancestor. Uh, way back uh, when philosophers studied this problem, uh, it was thought that the arthropods had a, a single common ancestor, and you had insects with uh, the centipedes and millipedes together, the crustaceans together, and the arachnids. And then early on, mind you, um, a fella, uh, Lancaster, uh, discovered that the horseshoe crab was really not, uh, not a crab. It wasn't a crustacean. It was actually a spider. And so what he thought was that the tree of arthropods was actually two trees, one consisting of spiders, including the horseshoe crab, and the other one uh, with two branches uh, consisting of <clears throat> the many legged creatures, the millipedes, centipedes, and hexapods, the insects and then the crustacean. So in, instead of one tree, we had two trees of arthropods that evolved separately. Later on, uh, a woman named Manta uh, divided the uh, arthropods into several groups uh, based upon uh, the functions of how the animal moves and lives in the various environments. So there was a, another tree with even more branches, but they were all separate. And so you remember when we talked about the characteristics of arthropods? Well, if you have one single tree, then all those criteria that we talked about, like having an exoskeleton, having segmented appendages and so forth can define that group. But when you have several trees that are independent in the revolution, then you don't have those characters that define those groups anymore. You have other different ones. And so in trees like that, that are not related. There's no such thing as an arthropod, and arthropods don't exist. And now I don't have to talk anymore. I can shut off this program and go home. Well, uh, molecular studies uh, are showing that arthropods really uh, have one tree. Most of the studies are saying that. And there are other problems with what they're finding out. But the bottom line for uh, this type of study is that it's not over yet. And so if there's anybody that's listening uh, that wants to uh, get involved in this type of study, uh, it will be very rewarding. And 
at the same time, it will be uh, the worst thing you ever started because arthropods are just so many. And with that, it's going to be very hard to try to put them in places like a tree like this. Uh, there's just so much diversity uh, in the way they look uh, that uh, it's still going to be a very hard project to do. But that doesn't mean it's not worthwhile doing. So now uh, I'm going to take you uh, into a dive into deep time. Uh, some of the early arthropods were animals called trilobites, and I'll show you some in a minute. Trilobites started about 550 million years ago, a long time ago, and then uh, they lasted to about maybe 200 million years. Uh, or 250 million years, somewhere in here. So they lasted about 300 million years. Now, we always talk about the dinosaurs and <clears throat> how long they lasted. Well, let's take a look at that. So from about 250 million to about 150 million, and they lasted maybe 100 million years, 150 million at top. So the arthropods, or at least some that you'll get to see, have been around twice as long as the dinosaurs. Arthropods are old, and I think that's one reason why they're so diverse. They had a long time to diversify. So here are the trilobites. And they're called trilobites, and my cursor's in the middle one here. They have uh, a part down the middle, a lobe, and also one on each side of it. So trilobite. Same here, a middle lobe with two on each side. And so that's where the term comes from. These were very successful animals. Uh, probably a change in environment made them go extinct. But here's an example of the different types. They're very diverse morphologically, and all of them lived in the sea. The arthropods um, started as marine animals. Another arthropod that I haven't mentioned are the eurypterids or the sea scorpions. Down here is an example of some of the larger ones. There are some that are much smaller uh, compared to the human here. And they also uh, were around for quite some time, not as long as the trilobites. So these are arthropods that had gone extinct. Many more have been described that are extinct. And uh, for those who are more interested, uh, you can uh, scroll the web and uh, find many examples. <clears throat> now, here's an animal that I've only collected once in Costa Rica. And in many schemes of arthropods, uh, this animal uh, tends to be one that is an ancestor to the insects. This is the velvet worm. Uh, we call them Ornicophora. Uh, and some scientists classify these animals as arthropods. They do have a chitinous exoskeleton. As they grow, they have to uh, create a new one and leave the old one. And all of them are predatory. They all have mandibles, but they do have, uh, I'm sorry, they do have mandibles, but they do have uh, uh, venom glands. Not harmful to people, but harmful to the prey. Very interesting. 
interesting animals um, and not very common. So now we're back to the tree again. And every so often, I'm going to bring this up as a reference point. So here uh, is a tree. It's got three main stems. On the left, you have the millipede centipedes and the insects in one large branch. In the middle, you have the crustaceans. And for some reason, the author put the trilobites in with the crustaceans. And that would be kind of uh, oh, a placement that's very controversial. Um, I've shown you eurypterids, uh, the sea scorpions, and they would go more in this line with the uh, spiders, the arachnids. <clears throat> and the Onychophora, uh, multi-legged animal, would be up here uh, with the millipedes in the centipedes. So we're going to talk about animals you find in each of those branches. So here uh, we have millipedes on the left and centipedes on the right. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, both are millipedes. Uh, these are cylindrical ones, they roll up. Uh, these tend to be flat, and there are some that are flatter that cannot roll up. Uh, and, and I think that you could come up with other animals that roll up when they feel threatened, and millipedes are one of those. Millipedes are not predatory. They feed on decaying or live vegetation. And I've had some African millipedes that were about nine or 10 inches long. And, uh, you know, they uh, are very good to have around, easy to hold and uh, talk about. Centipedes, on the other hand, are predatory. Here's the house centipede. If you see one in your house, don't kill it because it's getting rid of things that you don't want. Cockroaches, fly, larvae, other things that you don't want. So when you see them, just say hi, let them go on its way. These here, uh, you find in the West, uh, they're quite large, uh, five or six inches or more. <clears throat> they do bite, uh, have a painful bite. Um, also predatory. Centipedes are fast. The millipedes are slow motion trolleys, and uh, it just takes a long time to get from point A to point B. Whereas centipedes, they can do it in a gym. The difference, or one of the main differences between the centipedes and millipedes, is that these centipedes have one pair of legs per segment, the millipedes have two. Now you have two animals that I'm sure you haven't seen. Uh, I've had a intern uh, working on these. Uh, they're found in leaf litter. And if you go into a woods and gather some leaves, uh, put the leaves in a funnel with the light shining above, Everything that's alive will go away from the light, from the light and the heat, and uh, you can collect them in a jar of alcohol. Uh, these are uh, on the left, the symphylans. You see multi legs with long antennae, and these are uh, parapods. I don't know much about either. Um, they're lacking color because, again, they don't need it, being uh, always covered up leaf litter and uh, the top soil. And um, I've uh, seen a lot of them, uh, mainly collected by my intern. Nobody really knows too much about these animals. Then we have uh, hexapods, that six-legged animals that some are still considered insects by some scientists, others not. Uh, in the upper left 
and lower right, we have the springtails or calendula, six-legged animals. And this one at the bottom, it has a, <clears throat> a long appendage that hooks up right about here <coughs> into a loop-like structure. And if the animal feels like it's being threatened, that appendage at the end will leave the loop and it will just spring itself many, many times its length away from where it was. I'm sure that if these were 10, well, I would say 20 times larger, that they could jump, uh, you know, over cars and things like that. The one here in the upper right also has the appendage and can jump. If you look in the leaf litter, in a forest or in logs, on logs, you'll find these and they'll just jump out of sight uh, using that back appendage. Then you have cone heads here. They're tiny. They're like all one third the, the width of your little fingernail on your pinky. Uh, they're, I believe they're predatory. Uh, they don't have antennae, but their front legs are very long, and I believe that they take the place of antennae. These here are dipleurins, about the same size as the cone heads. Uh, this one's red because it's been stained and put on a microscope slide. And here we have a silverfish, and you may have seen some in your house. Uh, they like to be in the attics and the cellar um, where it's kind of dry. Uh, they like to feed on uh, the paste that binds books together and uh, very common. Uh, this one looks a little cylindrical, but many of them are kind of flat. And now we get to animals we know very well, the insects. And later in the program, uh, we'll show you many different kinds representing some of the main groups in uh, the class of sector. So now we're back to this tree again. And what I'd like to do here is to stop. If there are any questions in the chat room, uh, please. Uh, Type them uh, in Dottie if you would check to see if there are any questions. I'll see what I can do to answer them. I see one question in the chat that says, in your definition of an arthropod, one of the characteristics was three germ layers. What is that? Well, uh, this is one that I didn't really want to talk about because I'm not sure people would know what I'm talking about, but now that I'm put on the spot, um, it means that when the embryo is developing, there are three main layers. Uh, one for the uh, internal structures, and one for the external, and one intermediate. So uh, that's what they're talking about. And embryologists can give you a better definition than I. Embryologists are people who study the development of animals uh, before they're born. Any more questions? I see one that says, do local house centipedes bite or sting? No, uh, they don't sting. Uh, and uh, if they tried to bite, they couldn't because your skin is too uh, strong, you know, for it to do anything. The, the ones that I showed you on the slide, the big one, uh, from the Western United States, and they're found, they're found everywhere. Uh, it seems like the bigger they are, the harder they might. Do you have any more questions? Feel free to unmute. Okay, I'm going to continue on. And uh, we looked at this left branch, and now we're going to look at the central branch. Uh, 
the crustaceans, many of these we know because we use them for food. Many of us have eaten shrimp, uh, have eaten lobsters, and crabs, and uh, so forth. And uh, these are uh, animals that normally have 10 legs, uh, two pairs of antennae. Did you know that even barnacles were crustaceans? And then we have the sow bug or roly poly is uh, uh, another kind of what we call isopod. Some of these isopods get really large. There are some oceanic ones that are about a foot long. And trilobites, again, even though this tree has a branch uh, with trilobites coming off the crustaceans, uh, it probably doesn't belong there. Now we'll talk about uh, the arachnid line. And we call them chalicerata. The chalicerates are animals that uh, they have fang-like uh, appendages in the front, uh, no antennae, and um, I'm trying to think of anything else. I think they may have what's called book lungs in their abdomen, but I'm not sure if all of them have that. So it includes uh, scorpions, uh, pseudoscorpions, which are very, very tiny. You can find them in the leaf litter and on uh, tree bark. Uh, mites, which are very numerous. There are predatory ones. You know about chiggers, probably. And there are plant feeding mites. Sun scorpions, whip scorpions, hailless whip scorpions. Harvesters or daddy long legs. By the way, those red dot like things on the legs are mites. Many insects and arachnids carry mites. We have uh, sea spiders and then uh, the horseshoe crab, which is not a crab, but a marine spider. And now the insects. Now, we just talked about spiders, and they're different from the insects because the head and the thorax are fused on spiders, and then they have the abdomen. And insects, for the most part, uh, you're going to have three body regions. The, now, I didn't say body parts. Body regions. There's a difference. So we have the head in the thorax, in the abdomen. On the head, you have a lot of uh, sensory uh, structures, the eyes, the antennae, which are the noses. And then you have structures um, related to feeding that also have uh, what we call chemoreceptors, uh, where they taste. The thorax is basically for locomotion, wings for flying, and legs for moving, and the abdomen for uh, a continuation of the nervous system, which runs through the whole body, uh, the reproductive system, the ventilatory system for obtaining air, uh, and mating. And if you happen to be a or a wasp or an ant, some ants, uh, to sting and protect yourself. Oops. So we can divide insects up into three groups uh, based on how they develop. And some animals uh, within the insecta, uh, they hatch and they grow and they look the same. They're just bigger. And those would be the animals like the springtails and the silverfish. And in many of the schemes for uh, the arthropods, 
they're not even related to insects. When I was a student, uh, they were considered part of the insects. Uh, but today, um, it's divided on that. And we have what we call the hemimotabilis insect groups. These are the insects uh, that have incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, the nymph hatches from the egg, it gets bigger, develops wings, and then is an adult. Uh, just a few examples that I can give you would be crickets, grasshoppers, uh, animals like that. And then we have the insects with complete metamorphosis called the whole metabolist groups. And in these insect groups, uh, you have an egg, a caterpillar, a pupil stage, which the others do not, and then the adult stage. Each stage is much different than the other. Uh, and that's a big, big difference, which we'll get to see in a minute. So a metabola, the insects that uh, really grow, uh, but they look the same uh, from when they hatch to when they die. And that's the springtails, the uh, protura, the uh, diflora, and the silverfish. Then we have a group uh, that's part of the incomplete metamorphosis group. Uh, the dragonflies and damselflies and the mayflies. Uh, these groups, uh, the nymphs are aquatic uh, for up to years. They can stay as uh, or in the nymphal stage for several years, feeding as a predator, and then uh, emerging as an adult later on. Uh, the dragonflies and damselflies are both predatory in all uh, the immatures and as well as the adults. Uh, the mayflies are, uh, they can be predatory. Others, uh, I think, will feed on algae. Uh, and the uh, adult, uh, I believe, does not feed at all. And within the uh, hemimetabola, uh, those other insects with incomplete metamorphosis, these insects can fold their wing up above the body. You notice that, we'll go back, in the mayflies, they stick their wings up above like this. In the dragonflies, uh, they can't fold their wings along the body. The damselflies show a little bit of that. The dragonflies, not at all. So now we come to the stonefly, all aquatic as nymphs. We show you different uh, nymphal uh, body types, and then uh, the adult stage here. Still. With the hemimetabola, we have the praying mantis and the cockroaches. Many of our scientists now group them together as the Dictyoptera uh, based on the egg cases. Here's a mantid egg case and egg case of the cockroach. Other insects in the hemimetabolous group that we haven't talked about are termites. There's a soldier and workers. Look at the soldier's head, really big, uh, used. Uh, they have huge mandibles. And these are insects, the soldiers, that is. They have an attitude. And these are the reproductives. They're the only ones, uh, at least in our neck of the woods, this part of the country, uh, where the reproductives uh, leave the colony Others in the colony stay underground. If they come up into a house, 
uh, they have to uh, make a tube that attaches the ground uh, with the house. And then we have drips. Uh, you probably have never seen them before. They're very tiny, fringed waves. And if you're a bookworm, you might have seen these running across the page of an old book in your library. Libraries can't get rid of them, uh, but they're there. You just have to open up an old book and watch. Now the Orthoptera, still in the incomplete metamorphosis group. We have the grasshopper, Katie did, the cricket, and the walking stick. All hatching from the egg, uh, looking like more or less the adult, getting bigger. And those with wings will form wings later in their uh, development as they mature. Most of our walking sticks here uh, have no wings, but there are some that do. And I, I don't think they fly. I think they use the wings to try to uh, distract the predator. Now we come to a group called the true bugs. And you might have seen kids' books called Bugs, Bugs, and More Bugs. And somebody uh, made a title for me of a uh, talk that I gave. And it was really wrong times three, because there's only one group of insects that are really called bugs. And that's here, the squash bug, the ambush bug, the uh, stink bugs, uh, the plant bugs, the milkweed bugs, and the assassin bugs. They all have incomplete metamorphosis. Uh, the squash bug and the plant bugs and um, the milkweed bugs feed on plants. The uh, assassin bug here and the ambush bug are predatory. And stink bugs can be either. So there are predatory ones and those that feed on plants. These here are all predators, all hemiptera. These are toe biters. And they'll grab you with their front legs and stick their mouth part in it and jab you and send some digested juices in and then suck out uh, a milkshake later on. Back swimmers, they swim on their back with their uh, mouth part stuck up, and they go after anything that's caught at the top of the water, caught in the water tension. And we have uh, water boatmen uh, with legs for fast swimming, and they attack anything that they can overcome. Water striders, they actually skate on the water using the water tension to hold them up and uh, they'll patrol different uh, areas in the brook. And here, water scorpions, raptoral legs, they have a snorkel for uh, staying on the water for as long as they want. As long as they keep the snorkel above the water right here, the tip, they're good to go. If anything walks by, They'll grab it and again, like the giant water bug, uh, they'll stick their dagger like mouth part in, inject some digested juices, wait a while, and then have a milkshake. Not quite a milkshake, but maybe a fish shake or a, a, a dragonfly shake. And we get to the homoptera. Uh, and <clears throat> not too long ago, uh, we had the uh, group 10 emergence of Magis cicada. Uh, and they were all over the place. In fact, I can hear cicadas now. Different species. These are uh, group 10 Magis cicada. And we have plant hoppers, 
and spittle bugs. Here's the larva. You can't see it because it's in the spittle. Uh, and the spittle protects it from predators and also keeps it from losing water. And the bottom two here on the left and in the middle are tree hoppers, very different and uh, just the neatest insects of all. And in the middle and the top middle, one of the invasives that just came in a few years ago from Asia, the spotted lanternfly. Uh, I would like to know if anybody has seen one of these. You'll see them on trees, and they're very pretty, but uh, uh, as we're learning, very destructive. And also, part of the Homoptera are the aphids. You've uh, maybe read Eric Carl's book on the grouchy ladybug, and it loved aphids, and aphids will attack plants at the top, uh, mostly herbaceous plants, but there are some species that attack trees, and they're sap suckers. So when aphids are around and in numerous quantities, uh, they'll make leaves dry up just like that. And you have, now these are actually insects. Uh, this is a black insect, can't see it because it's uh, secreted a uh, substance that's hard. And the only way to get at the animal is to chip off this hard shellac type material and see the insects underneath. These also uh, are scale insects. Uh, the females mate with the male and then they become sedentary. That means they stay where they are. They make a shell for protection and all they do for the rest of their life is to uh, lay their eggs and uh, sit sap. Oop, sorry about that. Now we have mealy bugs and white flies. Fleas. Now they don't have wings. Well, why are they insects? Well, uh, at one time, uh, fleas probably had wings, and we can see wing pads in the pupa uh, of these insects. Uh, but their life is for uh, being on a host, feeding on blood. And we have Neuroptera. Uh, you probably have seen one of these called the Dobson fly. Uh, the females don't have such large uh, mandibles, uh, but you can find them at lights at stores. Then you have the green lace wings, and green lace wings as the larva like here, feeds on aphids. And then you have, uh, you probably have seen these funnel shaped structures in very fine sand. And that's at the ant line. And this is what is underneath that makes the funnel. The adult is here, doesn't feed. And here's a common family called the owl fly, whose immatures look a lot like those of the ant line. Most of these are predatory in the uh, larval stage. Not all are predatory in the adult stage. And the caddis flies. You've heard the story of the three little pigs, and one little pig made a house of grass, and the other one a house of sticks, and the other a house of stone. And caddis flies do the same thing. Some species make their cases of uh, plant material, grass, uh, leaves, others use sticks, and others use stones. So when you think of the three little pigs, think of the cadence flies. They're aquatic as larvae, and as adults, uh, they fly, and they're terrestrial. And they're the closest relatives to the butterflies and moths which we have here. 
so uh, the Lepidoptera, the name comes from the, the fact that they have scales on the wings. Uh, here are some inchworms, and in the spring, uh, we have uh, tents made by the tent caterpillar. Gypsy moths, male in brownish gray and the female white. Now, in the fall, we have uh, larvae that are making tents in many trees. The tents are big. This is of the fall webworm. And then you have the giant silk moths. These here, uh, if you have any garments that are made out of natural silk, uh, these are the cocoons. And they come from the only insect that's fully domesticated, only found in places where they grow them for natural silk and for experiments. Um, they're not found in the wild. And then we have a group, uh, the banded uh, woolly bear, and some that are triangular in shape. And this one, I love this one, one of my favorites. It's called Zale Lunata. And then some snout moths. The Lepidoptera have some uh, very primitive forms that are small. Uh, and this one here uh, actually has mandibles and feeds on pollen. Uh, this one is a leaf miner, as well as this one. And uh, these, as larvae, I believe, feed on uh, moths. Others here are leaf rollers. Here's one that looks like the letter T. And here's the peacock, the Lepidoptera, the mini plume moth, and the bella moth that you could see now on Joe Pivey's in the day or night. And I couldn't leave out the butterflies, the morphos with uh, their structural coloration, the cabbage butterfly, an invasive from Europe, the sort of dingy uh, catalpa sphinx, the silver spotted skipper. And here's a sphinx moth that flies in the day. Uh, a lot of times it's confused with uh, hummingbird moths. I'm sorry, hummingbirds. Uh, but they all uh, sometimes are called hummingbird moths for that reason. And then we have in the lower left uh, the uh, tiger swallow tail. Beetles, here's a caterpillar hunter, very fast, and about two inches long, uh, and a very beautiful animal. Here uh, we have uh, tiger beetles, also fast, long mandibles in the front, uh, top predator in open areas, whirligig beetles. They actually have a divided eye, so they can see underwater and above water at the same time. Really interesting beetles. And the diving beetle, which dives down with an air bubble. So it probably was one of our first scuba divers. There's a twig boring beetle, and what they do is uh, lay an egg in this area, twig falls off, and then the larva uh, escapes as a pupa. Sometimes they pupate inside. Bark beetles. Here's our uh, emerald ash borer. And these are flat beetles. 
and they were found under bark. The eye elater, stag beetles, and the Bessie beetles. Now, here's the beetle, and I'm going to ask you what kind of mouth part does it have? Sucking mouth parts, or does it have chewing mouth parts? I didn't mention to you before that in Lepidoptera, they have a mouth part that coils up and they feed on liquids. And many people, when they see a beetle like this, think, well, it's strong. But actually, the mandibles are right down here, chewing mouth parts. Here's a grouchy ladybug, bird beetle, feeding on aphids. The Japanese beetle uh, feeds on some fruits, but leaves. Colorado potato beetle, spotted cucumber beetle, and of course, our firefly, which lights up to try to attract uh, females so they can mate. Dermestids, uh, they, you know, if you have an insect collection and you don't put a fumigant in there, these are the guys that will go in and eat your collection. And then we have rogue beetles, really numerous group. Sometimes they put their abdomen up in the air. Uh, I don't know if there's a meaning for that. And now we get into the flies. Most dangerous insect of all, the mosquito. And then we have the drain fly. Some people see these and they think that they're giant mosquitoes, but they're actually drain flies, harmless. <clears throat> uh, these are midges, long antennae, harmless. And these are also midges. These are aquatic. Uh, these may be aquatic or semi-aquatic. The Midas fly, huge. The robber fly, a predator in open and thick forest, mostly open. <clears throat> there are some flies that mimic bees called uh, serpent flies. These flies, the stock eye flies, uh, were only one species in North America. I was fortunate to collect one when I was in my early 30s, but I'm still waiting to collect the second one. And then we have the dance flies, and you can find them anywhere. They usually are found on top of leaves. Most of them are metallic, and, uh, and they run on the surface of the leaf. Uh, that's, I think, how they got the name. <clears throat> now we get into some other flies. Uh, these here would be uh, bird flies. Find them on birds. Bat flies. These are horse or deer flies. And these here are flies that are picked up by animals when they eat. Eggs are usually laid on surfaces of leaves uh, and are taken in the bodies of cows and other animals that feed on vegetation, grasses mostly. And the larvae will feed in the stomach of the animal or through the stomach and through the hide uh, to pupate later on the ground. Uh, they cause a lot of damage to uh, the cattle and Then you have the fruit flies that are used for experiments, lots of pest species. The house fly. There's a fly called the tabanid fly, and they lay eggs on the caterpillars of uh, moths and butterflies. And then these, the flesh flies, uh, that are actually used for therapy. Uh, a person that has very large burns on their body and lots of uh, skin that's uh, uh, deteriorated or rotted, they'll put uh, maggots. And uh, maggot therapy is still used uh, on occasion for these burn victims or victims that have <clears throat> large 
large wounds with lots of necrotic skin. And the flies will eat all the necrotic material and leave the good flesh. And that's uh, why they're used. So then you can start the process in the patient uh, mending its wound naturally. Hymenoptera, the ants, bees, hornets, wasps. Uh, the primitive ones are called soft flies. The larvae, like here in the lower right, they have many of these fleshy legs on the bottom. And butterflies and moths, they usually have four. And the soft flies, many more. And the soft flies like uh the butterflies and moths they eat vegetation here's an example of one in the middle of the adult. and we have the ants this is ted schultz our ant guy at the smithsonian he studies ants that farm uh, they make fungus farms they <clears throat> make the fungus by getting plant material from the trees. It could be in the form of leaves or flowers. They munch it up, add the fungus, and they grow it. And here is uh, an actual farm. And each container has a different uh, job that goes on into it. So the ants compartmentalize all their functions in different areas. Uh, and this is artificial, of course, but they do it in the ground. So here you have army ants and driver ants that just go out and attack anything, um, whether it's uh, got a backbone or not, to feed the colony. Allegheny, Allegheny mound building ants, you can find these in uh, Maryland. And also honeypot ants, where the abdomen is full of sweet stuff, and a uh, member of the colony will go tap on the abdomen and get a drink. Now, some of our wasps are what we call uh, parasitoids. And in each case here, uh, you see a long part of the abdomen uh, either sticking out or not. <clears throat> and these animals will actually uh, use this pipe, really, uh, which will send an egg down, and the egg will be deposited in or on the prey. And when the larva hatches, it will feed on the prey item. These actually will, uh, this ovipositor, we call it, it's about four or five inches long, and they can actually bring that into a tree and find the prey and lay an egg. These wasps will feed on <clears throat> scarab beetle larvae that are subterranean under the ground. And here's one I just thought was cool because it showed a long ovipositor. And these are the smallest, probably the smallest insects in the world. They're called mimerids. They don't have a common name, but they're egg parasitoids. They find eggs of insects and lay an egg inside. They're only about, oh, one or two millimeters long. And there are 25 millimeters to an inch, so they're very, very tiny. And then we have some uh, social wasps. These are, uh, they're called, whoops, I keep doing that. They're called vespids. Uh, they make, a lot of them make paper wasps here, or paper uh, nest here. Uh, uh, cells are hexagonal, and they're all hexagonal no matter where. Uh, Ball-faced hornet. And here's uh, a vestment that actually makes a pot, uh, makes it out of mud, and it gets really hard. Uh, 
provisions the pot with uh, caterpillars and then lays an egg. And then when the larva hatches, it'll have fresh flesh to eat. Now, here's a different wasp, not related to the vespids, called the organ pipe mud dauber. And you find it making cells uh, underneath structures. And I always wondered why. And if you took the material from this, put it in water, and it would dissolve. These pots are made outside, and they are exposed to the weather. And there's some type of uh, water repellency to it because it won't dissolve. So I thought that was pretty cool. And then you have the predatory ones, the uh, tarantula hawks that will attack tarantulas, sting them to paralyze them, and then drag the tarantula into their uh, the tarantula's hideout. Uh, and then when the larva hatches, we'll eat the tarantula and develop. Cicada killers do the same, but their prey are cicadas. And then you have the wasp that will go after caterpillars, and some specifically attack spiders, like the tarantula hawk. And couldn't really forget the honeybee. Uh, that uh, we use to uh, pollinate many of our crops and get honey from bumblebees. And here's one I put in because I just love the sculpture on the body. These are called cuckoo wasps. They actually go into the honeybee nest, and for some reason they're not attacked, and they will eat the larvae of the honeybee. And then the murder wasp. The murder wasps are related to the uh, paper wasp. Uh, they came into uh, Washington State. And I'm told that uh, the ones that got out and actually made a colony, um, the colony was destroyed. But we'll see what happens this spring and summer uh, if there are actually no more of them around. And so that's the end. And I want to thank you again for having me. And I will take questions that are in the chat room. Donnie, if you would uh, check the chat room. Yep, I see a couple. And thank you so much for joining us. I see a question that says, are ticks arachnids or insects? Ticks are arachnids. Um, they, as immatures, have six legs, but when they become mature, uh, they have eight legs. Uh, some are predatory, others are plant feeders. Uh, and we all know chiggers, it's a special kind of, well, it's not a tick, it's a mite. Uh, and was that question specific for ticks or mites? It was specific for ticks. Okay. Yeah, ticks are totally uh, arachnids, mites are as well. And um, of course, we have the deer tick uh, that uh, transmits Lyme disease. And there are other ticks that also transmit, uh, I believe, uh, bacterial uh, borne diseases. The next question I see says, is it easy to tell a termite from an ant in the house? Oh, yes. Um, if you see a ant or an insect scurrying around, it's not going to be a termite. The termite is an internal feeder. Uh, it feeds inside of wood. Uh, if it's feeding in the wood in your house, it came from the ground. Uh, and made a connection, uh, which like a tunnel. Uh, so our termites are subterranean termites here, and they would be underground. Uh, there are also other uh, ways to distinguish termites.
termites from ants. Ants have elbowed antennae, and termites have like a beaded antennae. And except for the reproductives, all the termite casts are going to be, for the most part, non-pigmented, except for the parts of the head. So they'll be white. Are the local stink bugs predatory? Are ladybugs seem to have disappeared when the stink bugs arrived? Uh, the stink bugs, uh, I don't know how numerous they are in terms of species, but I do know that there are those that are uh, predatory and there are those that feed on plants. And the second part of that question was what? It, it said that it seems that the ladybugs disappeared when the stink bugs have arrived. Uh, I think that might have been a, a coincidence for wherever that observation was made. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no connection between the stink bugs and the ladybugs. And I don't know of a ladybug that, <clears throat> well, they feed on aphids and other uh, larvae, but uh, I've never seen a stink bug feed on an aphid. Uh, I wouldn't discount it, but uh, normally uh, if I see a ladybird beetle feeding on an aphid, I might see a serpent fly feeding on an aphid. I might see uh, a lacewing larva feeding on an aphid, but haven't yet seen uh, a stink bug do it. I'm not saying it can't, but I just haven't observed it. The next question I see says, is there anything that will keep the stink bugs away? Uh, you're probably talking about the marmorated stink bug and uh, the only thing I can suggest is if you have a lot of them that are gathering together, just uh, vacuum them up and uh, do whatever you need to do with them afterwards. How do the honeypot ants actually drink from each other? Is their skin porous? Well, uh, for the honeypot ants, there's only a select few where the abdomens uh, get large and uh, fill up with the uh, sweet uh, material. Um, and <clears throat> other members that have normal size abdomens will just come to feed. Uh, so they just tap on the abdomen and um, sort of like a water bubbler, I guess. Next Can question. stag beetles be found locally? Stag beetles? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the immatures, uh, you can find underground or in logs like Bessie beetles and some of the uh, other scarab beetles. And um, there's a, a few species that are common, um, but I think as you get more subtle, uh, you'll find the big one that has uh, the males have these huge uh, stag like mandibles. I don't see too many. There's a common one here, but you know, it, uh, its mandibles aren't huge like the one that I showed. Do we have any more questions? Feel free to either send them in the chat or unmute at this time and ask them yourself. Well, if we have no further questions, I would just like to say thank you all so much for joining us tonight. I hope you all enjoyed tonight's presentation as much as I did and learned something new. Of course, as always, if you think of any questions later, you can always email us at info at poolsvilleseniors.org and we can pass them along. If you'd like to unmute or turn on your camera now to say goodbye, now's the time. If you're joining us on Facebook Live, please leave a like and comment. 
We'd like to thank Dr. Damsky for this presentation, as well as our ongoing sponsors and private contributors that help us keep our programs going because we love putting them on for you. If you have enjoyed tonight's program, please consider joining us for more upcoming events. This time next week, we'll be back with Ride With Us on the Long Island Line, showcasing Brian Sharon's over 300 square foot model train room. It's absolutely amazing. He built it over 30 years. I got to have a sneak preview when we were doing a Zoom check. I would highly, highly recommend registering to join us for that event. I think it'll be super entertaining. So check it out at our website, poolsvilleseniors.org for registration and more info. And thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Have a nice evening. Thank you. 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 Thank you.